Ricker. Nick, how are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Uh, I've been doing a little reading here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, of course the latest were. issue, the latest issue of JAIS came out, and uh, I looked and at a couple of things. Your paper is in it. That's right. It is Buddy actually Uri Gal and, and yes, Friedrich. yeah, from, from yeah. Gal. They're your your fellow German, exactly. Well, he's actually my uh, I don't know what he called that, like a substitute replacement professor kind of guy. Like he he took over my my teaching duties after I left Cologne before they hired someone else, sort of as a someone to step in and do you know do the teaching loads kind of thing. So he's technically yeah, he, the new Jan. <laughs> and, well, he's actually following your footsteps in more than one way because he comes from Australia, but he's German. So he's one of those German Australians like you. We're you know? everywhere. We're absolutely everywhere. Yeah. Can I say that I didn't? I didn't understand your paper, by the way. Like I have no idea what it, what it's about. But it's okay. It's too deep for me. You're you're not that bright. You know, you have your one thing you do. If it's not, if it's not, it's what, not what do you box. do exactly? <laughs> I do boxes and arrows. Boxes and arrows, man. Yeah. There was an abstract concept. You can't handle that. Uh, you only like your abstract concepts. You don't like. All right. To the backstory, I'm writing a paper with Wrecker, and we're using institutional <laughs> theory in one of their versions. And Wrecker uh, puts instead of using abstract concepts like institutions and da da da, we get to the real root of. I don't know how you phrased it. We get to the actual, and and we talk about the coherence of the and it's like oh so instead of this abstract concept we're using your favorite abstract concept and then absolutely it's but it's way less abstract it's way more concrete my abstract con concepts are much closer to reality than your abstract concepts yeah right <laughs> yeah, so anyway i'm reading this jais and uh and the first thing there was our our friend jerry kane right and he wrote this how to write a paper how to write an a paper and uh it, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like there's this genre of how to write a paper stuff, not only in our field, but in other fields. So uh, they're popping up here in, in JAIS now. But he's, he has a little section where he talks about what an empirical paper is not. And it's yeah. a simple report of your research. And I thought maybe this, this inspired me. Maybe we can talk about this. You know, a lot of us get into this because we're interested in the in the phenomenon and we we like doing research and we like digging in and then we want to report on what we found right so it's a but the the point here is that you know it's it's not just a report of your research we're not high paradigm physicists that can just do an experiment everyone knows what our setup's going to be and then and then we just report the finding and then that gets us published uh the writing component which That's is the important. The packaging, the phrasing, the argumentation, uh, because we're we're a low paradigm field, if you will, right? We we don't have all the scaffolding, just like you just said, you don't understand my JAIS paper. Well, that's because you don't do research on, you know, diffusion of technology across fields, right? Yeah. If you did do research on diffusion of technology across fields, I would hope you'd at least have a little more. Uh, so, so that's the problem is we have all these different people. It's like Tower of Babel. They're all coming together in the same journals. And then uh, uh, we can't just throw out our finding and expect all of those people coming from all those different traditions to be able to understand it. We need to find our conversants. We need to write to them. And then we need to, uh, so the writing is critical. It is right? critical. Let me, let me, let me make two points here. I mean, one is a little story of where that became really palpable for me. So I once had a, a, a postdoctoral student and I had him when I was sort of finishing his PhD and I became part of his uh, committee, his advisory team. Um, so he was a guy, uh, trained in psychology, very quantitative, came into IS, did IS type of work. And he had a girlfriend and, you know, his wife and mother of his kids and stuff like this. And she's a, a trained psychologist uh, in, uh, uh, um, uh, in, in clinical uh, end of life care, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. and they both did the Ph.D., in similar different fields at the same university, finishing at the same time, moving to postdoc position. They got really lucky in that they both had postdoc position in the same city. That doesn't happen all that often anyway, right? Yeah. So they were both on the same track uh, and had to do the same things, which means, you know, build a pipeline, get your papers out and stuff. So yeah. here's a guy and he works with me and we do organizational process, IS type of stuff. And here's she writing a bunch of psychology of end of life care. Yeah. Now, within four months, 
she had five papers out in some yeah. top psychology journals, all of which were six pages long, introduction, method, finding, bam. You know, all of them yeah. of the same type of highly scripted, no bullshit, no theory. This is what we did. This is the variable we measured. This is the result, etc. And we went through, you know, multiple years of several late stage rejections at all of our top business journals. I remember one third round rejection oh, at JOM. Then we tried <laughs> this one. Then we tried this other one. We literally could never get in. And in the end of that, after four years, he got so frustrated, he literally quit. And so like, I can't do this. I can't have this while at the same time seeing a different field with my, where my wife, similar qualification, both well-trained scholars, and for her, publishing was just, yeah, I, I need to write it up so I can report the research. And mm -hmm. we were struggling with all this conceptual and the framing and the writing of it all. Right. Yeah? And, and so that was a real palpable, real big issue. And that yeah. it got me thinking. And, and, and I struggled with this for a long time because at some level, you know, this is something I think, well, it should be, you know, why can't we have that? We're scientists. Why can't we just do science, report it, and end of story? And the way that mm -hmm. I explain it to myself now is that we are in a, in a field of science that really is about ideas. It's more yeah. about ideas than the insights, more about the ideas and the ways to look at the world, more about the concepts and the ideas than it is about the facts and the findings and the measures and stuff like this. So it's not a yeah. real hard Empirical science is really more of an idea. And the management, the business is like that, right? The big, it's all about the big ideas. And for that, framing writing matters. So that's the way that I explain it to myself. That just, this yeah. is the currency of the realm. To me, it's all about the big ideas. And yeah, yeah, then I need some data to back that up. But really, it's about the big ideas. How do I tell ideas? Through writing. Yeah. And it, and it doesn't even have to be a big idea, actually. I think no. the, the key to writing is this. Uh, so, so in other fields, so you bring up medicine, for example, or, or, you know, and, and I don't know much about medical research. I know a little bit, and this is what they do. They, they all know what their method is. Typically it's, it's some sort of clinical trial. They all know what the sample is. They all know what the design is, right? Um, uh, and they, they know the existing people who have done a similar study. And, and if you do it and they do it and, and you have a bigger sample and, and a couple of people have published it with a smaller sample or a different sample, you do it and, and they'll publish it, right? Because they want to build a number of these in the journals together. Uh, and then eventually someone's going to do like a meta-analysis or something like that. And then they'll tell you, you know, if it, if the treatment appears to, to work or something like that, right? Uh, you don't need framing. You don't need theory necessarily. You don't need all of that. And you don't need to describe your methods. You don't need to, you know, uh, so the, the traceability, sure, you, you want to be able to maybe share your data set and all of that sort of thing. But the, uh, the, the burden on uh, front and back of the paper really is, is much smaller. In ours, you know, even if I'm doing qualitative research, and even if I'm doing qualitative research on enterprise systems, right, or something like that, I still need to locate myself. Uh, you know, if I'm if I'm doing that, what do we, what have other people said? How is what I'm saying going beyond it? Why is it interesting? You know, I have to spell all this out to them, or else the average reader, you know, is not gonna is not I gonna. I mean, there's, know, a, there's so. a couple of reasons for this, right? Number one, they have a fixed problem space, right? Their their mm -hmm. problem space is the human body, and by and large, it doesn't change, right? Yeah. So that means if you don't have to worry about a shifting or moving. A phenomenon or problem space then really That's a good point. you can you can you can standardize the other one is really that the entire training and practice is super highly standardized yeah. and all medical students at least at the you know the good schools throughout the country they all do the same stuff it's completely internationally standardized etc so they can assume that everyone knows what an rct is a randomized cl clinical trial they all know this yeah. by heart because they all do yeah. the same courses with the same textbook on the same topic, and then you don't have to worry about explaining that to everyone. <laughs> yeah, we have neither of these two things. We have a shifting problem space yeah. where either the phenomenon or the technologies or the organization setting or just the environment in, in general just changes all the time. So, you know, it's always different. And we don't have the same standardized practice or training for that matter. So we can't assume that everyone knows everything. So that I always have to work with the assumption that my reader doesn't know anything about what I'm doing, neither the topic, yeah. nor the theory, nor the method, nor anything. 
Which is another thing uh, Jerry Kane puts in his paper. It's kind yeah. of interesting. He says, write to a first-year doctoral student, which I that like. That was an interesting one. Uh, yeah. that, I've never thought of that before. The other thing he had in that was the minimum publishable unit, right? He has this idea, which I've never heard of before either, but I like both of those bits of advice. Uh, you know, the other thing, and it just occurred to me, difference between us and, and say medicine, is if you're in a hospital and you do a clinical trial, you're in a research hospital, there's no difference between practice and research, right? You'll use it in your practice. It's part of your practice and you publish it in the medical journal, right? Uh, for us, if you're doing data analysis in industry, you don't want to publish it in practice, right? You, you don't, or you don't want to publish it in a journal and the journal doesn't want to publish what you're doing, right? Because that's in, that's just data analytics in industry, right? If you're analyzing your employees, you know, uh, you need something more to get that published in a or else you're just doing i don't know which goes back to this, this is not enough you need a new idea it doesn't have to be the yeah. big idea but really they like, like the business schools and the management all the big names that you can think of these are all big ideas they're, they're all very often grounded in very solid research for decades and stuff like this you know caught us change model i don't know Portis five forces whatever yeah uh, they're all grounded in research of course but really I think it was always about the ideas. And if you think more about close to home, if you think about Young Jin Digital First, that's a big idea. It's grounded yeah. in his observations. And, you know, he's been doing research on digital innovation, all that sort of stuff for, for a long time. But it's the ideas that, that, that yeah. matters, really, right? So, and that's the value. And that's what we're looking for. I think also, I mentioned this as an editor. I think that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the, the, the big ideas. And if the big idea is good and really big or really shiny or really new, or really exciting, then we even make compromises. Then the data doesn't have to be that good or the method don't have to be that robust or solid or whatever. Then maybe 30 interviews are enough. You know what I mean? Like, so sometimes yeah. we then give leeway to authors because we're looking for that shiny idea. I think. Well, so I actually think that there, when you say big idea uh, versus maybe not so big idea, and I don't know if I, I don't think I've had any big ideas. I think no. you mentioned one with I Young mean, Jin. <laughs> uh, I mean, not you, but you know, we uh, or, or yeah. something. Yeah. Very few of us have big ideas. I think the big ideas come from two places, right? One is a uh, review of other big ideas and somehow reconciling them and going beyond them, right? And we've talked about this in previous podcasts, the great thinkers. Now, you can almost, so my advisor, uh, Kale, said that the two big thinkers, say in philosophy from the 20th century, are going to be Wittgenstein and uh, Habermas, right? And uh, Habermas basically just did lit reviews, right? And, and he integrated everyone from Freud to all the philosophers to the American pragmatists to whatever, and then to, to come up with his big idea, right? Uh, and really, I think in, in management research or information systems research, that's how we come up with our big ideas through reviewing other, reviewing empirical work. You don't get a big idea by doing an empirical study necessarily. Well, uh, not one anyway. You know, you would have yeah. to be like Tversky and Kahneman and do 40 years on experiments yeah. and decision making. And then you realize how, you know, system one and two works. So that is also yeah. the path, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a trajectory. It's a whole history. Uh, and then you get your big idea or uh, reviewing literature, you get your big idea. The other way, and I think a lot of people have done this over history, and I would say Young Jin is too, and does this, where you kind of, yeah, you address existing research sort of, but you just throw out your idea. Right. And sometimes it's just really cool. And you don't need to do the lit review and all of that. My my problem is that that's usually what I get and they don't do as good a job as like Young Jin or Carl Weick or these people who just kind of throw it out there without necessarily putting the burden on themselves to integrate previous stuff. I think yeah. it's just misleading. I think like yeah. the Carl Weick, I know what you mean. Like you mean that how do you write a piper? Do I write a paper by reviewing the literature first and saying how it's deficient? And has gaps or problems here, left, right, and center, and have a big table of all the assumption that it carries forward. And then I yeah. challenge that. And then, you know, by the time I get to my idea, I'm on page 25, you know? Yeah. And all of yeah. that, uh, page 1 to 24, are not, you know, it's me doing a thorough literature review. And yeah. the other idea is more like Young Jin style. So, like, I come up with my idea on page 1 or 2 yeah. or 3, and I, exp you know, flash that out. And then I weave in my command of the literature later. I think... It's yeah. misleading in the sense that it looks like you don't do a thorough literature. No, you know, we know Young Jin, like he's read everything yeah. widely and broadly and deeply. It just, it doesn't show like that in the paper. And that's, you know, I think that's the big challenge for people to do. Like if you can master that, 
if you can show through your writing that of you know this literature even though you don't spend the first 20 pages on reviewing that that's a masterful craft i think that's how yeah. i look at it it's very difficult to do <clears throat> carl wake is the the poster child for this and you know he read heidegger right he uses words like <clears throat> excuse me he uses words like thronus and whatever which are heideggerian terms but he never cites heidegger he does reference the american pragmatists like william james and such occasionally but he he doesn't like build on them the way we would we amateurs or you know would, would build on existing work right so those are the brilliant people with their big ideas and i don't think we aspire to that i think at least for me i just aspire to an empirical finding right and it would be really nice to do an experiment show the results be done with it right i have one of of those right now that that we're trying to you know work think, up the paper yeah. and and it's been six months since we're done with the experiment we haven't written the paper yet because it's waiting for me to do it and it's like the results are there i could have put them on on a ssrn or something like that already and then and the results are out and i think they're kind of interesting but now we're going to go through a multi-year process of framing I them know. You know, and it, you know, it, it, I think over a while it gets dragging. Like, the, what do you explain to me? Yeah. I would like, boy, I don't really feel motivated to even start with that process now because you know you're right. Like, you can take this result, but it probably takes you four years. I have that at the moment. We have an experiment we did in 2016. You know, mm -hmm. showing that doing this information system gets people to do less of this and this and that, whatever. Yeah, well, it's 2022 and we're in round three of the fifth journal that we tried and like, like who cares? It'll, but the, the, the yeah. fast that it comes out is 2024, you know, 2016. This is three years prior to the pandemic. It's seven years before the war. It's even, yeah. God knows, before Greta Thunberg, it's a sustainability paper, you know? Mm -hmm. But from a, it feels like from a completely different age. So who cares yeah. when it gets out? It should have been out in 2017. It's a simple experiment. When we, you know, turn off that light bulb, this and this stuff happened, it goes down by 27. Why are we yeah. sitting here still writing this stuff and revising it, right? So I do think there is, a, that's what I mean. Like I do feel sometimes that there should be a place that we could just go out and report signs like the well, medicine people could, you know? Like well, and I think we can. Page report and done. So, so I think we can. And I think there are some, like actually, you know, uh, Aaron Schechter at UGA with uh, Eric Bogert, one of his students who who I worked with with him when I was at UGA. They're publishing in the Scientific Reports. Nature it's a journal, reports, yeah. right? And and uh, you know, it's it's like there are these places where you could do stuff like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've done this too. I've I've, I've got one paper in uh, PLS One, Public Library of Science One, which is their um, open access journal, which. The review process is only about method, not about contribution, not about theory. They only check your methods. Yeah, mm -hmm. like and they like I've reviewed for the journal as well. They really instruct you. Look, uh, we don't care what it's about. We don't care. What it's about. Look at the methods. If the methods are fine, we're going to publish it. And this is mm -hmm. fine. And we've done this as well. It was a solid little empirical study survey based and it's out there. But first of all, no one knows about it. Second of all, in our currency system, this doesn't count. So you think like scientific reports doesn't count? I, th I think it totally does, doesn't it? Yeah. How many people know Aaron's paper? I know I know what you mean. I don't know. On Twitter, right? So I, I don't think it has quite the same uptake. It should, but it doesn't. You know what I mean? I don't know. So, it has the nature kind of brand with it. And, well, uh, nature has like 27 different sub journals. Like, come on. You know, same yeah, with know. Yeah. So, hey, let me let me get back on track here. Uh, you Let's talk about this minimum publisher unit. Minimum publisher unit. Because I don't think this is really... Uh, I don't think you can line it very well to this big idea thing that I talked about. Like a mm -hmm. mission publisher unit goes in the direction of what you just said. Here's a study. Here's an hypothesis. It's supported. It's done well. This should be published. It's a mission publisher unit. Get it out there. Be, be done with this. Um, I don't, I'm, you know, it's sort of like MPUs. I've heard of it as a, as a way of thinking about how to build my portfolio. Think about managing publisher unit, making sure they don't overlap too much, so you don't have plagiarism concerns, stuff like that. Thinking about your data sets, it's like this data set will, will be for this paper and this other for that other paper. But in the context of writing one paper, I'm not sure this is a thing. What I would say is this very common sort of rookie mistake of people think that they need three research questions for a paper, you know? Yeah. And I always tell them that, no, just, just have one. Your mission publisher unit is one research question with one answer. That's it. Like you mm -hmm. don't need three, let alone four or five, 
Yeah, you or know. two. Yeah, people think they need to have two to three research questions. I was like, okay, which of them can we delete? So I think mm -hmm. if I think of mention publish shield unit, I think like, can we can we can we ask one question for which we can give one answer? I think that's that's how I would think yeah. about it. No? Yeah, I mean, so I think that's so. Let's go with what you're. I don't. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure that's the way Jerry Kane is uh, thinking of the minimum publishable unit. Maybe it is, but I kind of looked at it like a minimum viable product in in uh, entrepreneurship, where where you start with something, get it out. Like when you're writing, you do the minimum, just the the bare bones argument, and then you flesh it out. Uh, oh, okay. So, no, I never thought of it this way. I think you so, meant the one paper, yeah. as one story argument. One paper. So one maybe story. that is the better the better interpretation. I'm just giving you my thought, but but both of those makes sense right if you're writing a paper start with the minimum what is the minimum of my story uh and i actually do this i give uh i've given a talk to phd students actually around the world where i give them my nine sentence introduction and then i say you don't have a paper unless you can do these nine sentences right and i don't mean each one has to be one sentence if you start turning it into a paragraph you start giving me tables then you're you you don't know what you're actually saying and the nine sentences are essentially here I'll, I'll read them to you uh the first sentence is state what the problem domain is right uh uh second is what's the situation in the problem domain right so you're locating yourself so it's very general then specific and then what are the conclusions of existing literature in that domain and then what's the problem with those conclusions right what's the and then and then you say your study and then you say your findings, right? And there, I spell that out in sentences. But if you can't say each thing concisely with a sentence, you don't know what you're saying in an empirical paper, right? And so I like that idea of a minimum viable paper or a minimum publishable paper as a bare bones. If you don't have that specific argument, then you don't actually know what you're saying. You're just writing blah, blah. Now, <laughs> blah, blah. that's that. That's what I, so, so that's the way I was looking at it. And then you can flesh it out as you need to. But what you're saying is, you know what, let's get that experiment that you did in 2016. We should have a place to just publish it. And, and I've argued before with you that we should be doing 80% research notes. Yeah. And, uh, and that would be a vehicle to do that. Absolutely. Yeah. We don't need a new journal. We can actually do it in the space we have because you're absolutely right. Not everything has to be this big idea. And, and it's actually also true. We have been publishing incremental things. Like, I, again, good example would be the, the, the wealth of TAM research. Well, they took TAM or a variant of it and added this one additional thing. You know, how about social norms? How about perceived behavioral control? How about trust? You know, and this is in a way very incremental. Take the same thing, add one box, which is three more survey items. And at that, that's a wonderful research note. There's nothing wrong with this. You know, do it, say mm -hmm. this extends our explanation, end of story, done. Perfect research note. We do way too little of that. Still in this year, you know, we see these statistics of submissions every year. I don't know, what is that? 5% of papers are submitted as a research note? I think most of the research yeah. notes that we get to see are actually converted into research note during the review process. They all start yeah. as articles and then people do something. I know Jerry does that sometimes and he writes about it. He says like, look, uh, that's a risky revision. It might be a more achievable, feasible revision if you trim it down to this one story and publish that one as a research note. But very, yeah. how often have you submitted a research note? A paper? I've started to lately. So okay. this year, uh, well, I don't know, in the last year or so, I think uh, out of the last couple of uh, papers, at least two or three were research okay. notes that cool. are submitted. And I'm actually trying to, to, to go that way with my research. I figure I only do full papers if I feel like I'm doing some major thing. I think research note takes a lot of the pressure off of you, takes it off of the editorial team, and it forces you to be very succinct. So, so but yeah, it's actually not to easy to write, don't you think? I mean, I yeah. think they're difficult to write because of that limit of what thirty pages. And, you know, yeah. it makes you think thirty pages. That's still a lot of pages, right? But it's actually yeah. fairly difficult if you're used to writing these fifty-page grand essays all the time. Well, we we just tried a qualitative research note, which is the first time I've ever oh, done that. So, yeah. so we'll see what happens with that, and then, uh, and then most of the time it's quantitative, right? So if we did a quick study, 
you know, I have a couple of those in various rounds at this point. Uh, so yeah, I actually like the idea of research notes. I'm, I'm going to try and do more and more of that because I'm an empiricist. You want to be focused, you want to get it out there. And I'd much rather it could publish sooner than, than be gold plated and be published three years later. Right. Yeah. I mean, of course you can say that in your, in your position, right? So I had a, I had a meeting yeah. this morning with uh, two postdocs or you sort of two junior people and they have they have three years left on the contract they need at least two more a stars or something you know that puts you in a very difficult situation because when then you go through your research portfolio it's like which of them has the potential of becoming an a star paper what do i have to do now to sort of even get it in the pipeline no it'll take me the next three years you know mm -hmm. they have to do it right now and that's very different from because there were a couple of these ideas where like, look, this is really nice. Just do that, write it up, send it to some journal and it'll be out next year. Wonderful. Yeah. But unfortunately, that's actually not going to help them. They do you think a research note is less status than a full paper? Like, let's say I get a full paper at MISQ or a research note at MISQ. I've heard of schools and I don't know to what extent that is still the case. Not not in Europe, I don't think. But in, in, in the US, I've heard there's some schools that literally uh, count, count them as half a paper or something. I've heard that. So I don't know whether that's still the case, but I do think for a long time they they were being dismissed as being a, a less of a, of a of a true paper or something. I think that's how people. Some people think about them. I don't know anyone who actually thinks about them that way. Well, I can tell you, like if I publish a research and I'd be incredibly proud of it. Simple. Yeah. I think you know. Cause I also, think it's I think the it's same. A, it's a nice challenge too. You go and do and write this really nice, good, solid, incremental empirical contribution in 20 pages. Like, I don't yeah. even know I can do it, right? So I, I would like, just for the, the challenge of that, I would like that. And I would be very, very proud of that. So to yeah. me, the I, status would be actually pretty high. Yeah. I personally don't draw a distinction between the two and don't think people should. I think the fact that we're distinguishing between the two is uh, is limiting research because now people all think that their study must be a full paper because they spent so much time on it. If we just said, look, there's no difference. You're telling me if I publish in nature or science, it, it doesn't matter what I published in nature or science. It could be a full research. It could be a this, it could be a, uh, no, it's, it's nature or science, right? Yeah. Um, it should be the same way with our top journals. It doesn't matter what the format is. It could be a commentary. It could be a research note. It could be a full paper. We have this idea that these full papers are somehow this wonderful thing, whereas everything else is just a little aside. No, some of the most cited papers are commentaries. Uh, some of the most interesting and awarded papers are research notes. So it's like, you know what, just do the thing yeah. that fits the study you did. And there should be no status difference, I don't think, and, between and those. And also, like, of these 45-page full papers, really... There's three pages of good ideas and three pages mm. of an idea that you actually work on, right? Like, you know, I remember some passages from some of the big papers and the other 40 pages I don't even like. So AMR is a wonderful yeah. example. I think AMR has sometimes really good ideas on the first three pages. The rest is rubbish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, very often yeah. it's rubbish. Like the big idea is at the front and I like it mm. and the rest is just, I don't know. Like it always looks to me like an artifact from the review process. Yeah. <laughs> they have to do a whole bunch of propositions and then they have to support those propositions and the, and the idea is good. And then the propositions that flow from it are lame as anything. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do hey, I, I got more. Um, I want to pick your brain a little bit more because um, I think uh, Jerry makes this one really interesting side comment about the title and the abstract. It's one of his other things that he mentioned in his papers. Uh, mm -hmm. And I liked it very much. He says crafting the title and the abstract is like search engine optimization. And I yeah. fully agree. And I think by and large, we're really bad at this. I know I am, but he's yeah. right. Like that's the way to look at it, right? The title and the abstract, you got to think of it as a search engine optimization to make sure you even have the possibility for creating some sort of impact that your ideas get heard. Yeah, and I have a perfect example of this. Uh, <clears throat> my first MISQ paper, I did when I was a PhD student and I did it with other PhD students and we named it arguing the value of virtual worlds, right? The worst title you could imagine in the world. It's about sense making, right? And then we have a tagline patterns of discursive sense making of an innovative. It's like blah, 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 arguing. <laughs> what a horrible start. It's like, I'm really proud of this paper. I liked it. We were PhD students. I think in naming the paper, if I look back, I was trying to be all sophisticated, right? Or I don't know what the hell I was doing. I was, I was, uh, but it's like the most obfuscatory 
title yeah, for a paper. And I'm surprised, I'm not surprised at all that people didn't find it and, and whatever. Right. So, so I think you're right. You need to base it. Cause now everybody's going to Google scholar to find papers. So you need to have the theory and the, you know, point of your paper in the title so that when people put it in Google Scholar. So let's dissect this a little bit. What's it in a good title? I can tell you what I do, and I think it's really bad practice. So most of my titles, I've just looked at my own webpage here. Most of them either start with a question and then some sort of stuff, thing, something, or a, a statement with, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, designing digital market offerings. <laughs> How digital ventures do something, something. Like, first of all, it's, like if it's this big a title. It has like 50 words in it. Um, or I have these really weird uh, uh, question marks. Uh, but I don't know. I don't, I don't think they're catchy. I don't know their search engine optimized. I, but I don't know. All right. I'll give you one of my papers. I'm looking, I'm looking at mine, and I, there's one I did great. And it's, uh, I did it with Jay Gooley in Organization Science in 2012. This is the title of the paper. Digital Innovation in the Division of Innovative Labor, Digital Controls in the Automotive Industry. You know, so there's a colon there. Uh, I signaled digital innovation, signaled the division of labor, digital controls, right? And then automotive, right? So we said exactly what's there that someone might search on. No? So, what, what, so what I are like we... that one. That that's great. So what? You, but you know, they're sort of lame in the sense of what you're doing is you put a couple of topic f keywords into the title, so everyone mm. that studies digital innovation immediately picks it up. What do you think yeah. about catchy titles like I don't know, the early bird catches the worm, early market entry strategy, or something? Yeah, that's what I tried to do with that arguing the value of virtual, and that's stupid. I, I, that's so those catchy things. Well, yeah, all right, but it's what I attempted to do. 15 years ago or whatever. But uh, yeah, I don't really like those. I think uh, you just put in the thing. You know, what's the greatest title ever in the history of a paper is our paper on managing artificial intelligence. That, <laughs> like, <yeah. how? laughs> those That's are the three should. words. <laughs> that will show up on every Google Scholar search. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, would it? I don't know. But I like the idea. I like the idea of title and abstract, particularly title. I have another paper, Institution, Institutional Contradictions and Loose Coupling. Uh, it's 2012. It was like one of the first, if not the first, institutional logics paper in the IS field. If I could rewrite that paper, I would say Institutional Logics and Loose Coupling, which was my dissertation. I wanted to be clever because I thought I was making a conceptual uh, contribution with that idea of contradictions. Other people didn't talk about it. So I put it in the title. That was probably bad because people doing institutional logic stuff now did not find that paper, right? If they were Okay, using so what Google I'm hearing, so like, like if I go through mine, I don't find any good advice from how I write titles at all. So what you're well, your saying- your representation theory. You have that. Yeah. So you have representation theory in the title, right? Yeah. So what I'm hearing from this and from your example is that you want to, the conversation that you're contributing to, whether that be institutional logics or digital innovation or representation folks, that should be in the title. Ideally, yeah. with that key term that people associate with that conversation. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think that should be in the title. Absolutely. If you're doing one on exploration, exploitation, you put exploration, exploitation in the title, right? Yeah. Uh, because, you know, for example, there's this one paper that we wrote, it's called Rediscovering Handoffs. Well, that doesn't tell you anything about what that paper is about. People don't know this paper very well. It's, a, it, you know, it's, it's, it's about process theorizing. It's actually computational analysis, blah, blah, blah. But it's not in the title. Rediscovering Handoffs, I think, just plays to the, to the journal. It's published in Ed Academy of Management Discovery. So rediscovering something is exactly what a discovery is, you know. So it's sort of, so, we sold it to the journal, but not to the So audience. let's think, how would we rename that paper? Because it's actually a beautiful paper, you're rediscovering handoffs. It's really cool, and it's an important... Uh, I think, and I've used it actually. Uh, we haven't published this yet, but we're we're uh, we're writing a paper and we're using your idea on hand, of handoffs. But who are your? So let me walk you through this. Who are your conversants in that paper? Who are you actually writing to? All the people, all the routines people, I would say. Right. So you should have the term organizational routines somewhere in the title. Yeah, so okay. it should have said rediscovering handoffs in organizational routines. Yeah, okay? that would already been. That would have been much better in terms of search yeah. engine optimization. Absolutely, just this little addition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I, so maybe that rediscovering handoffs and organizational routines, or even another thing, spelling it out to them a little bit, like handoffs, uh, critical. Because what you have, I'm looking at your site, at your uh, Google Scholar right now, and what's really interesting is your second most cited thing is 
how much language is enough? I guess you tried to be real clever there. That says nothing, right? That's on. <laughs> but the second half of that is theoretical and practical use of the business process modeling notation, right? right? You actually tell, first of all, business process modeling notation, right? So you have immediately attracted all those people doing research on BPMN. So those are your yeah. conversions. And then you have theoretical and practical use. Boom. Uh, and it was early. Well, it wasn't even that early for BPM. So, so no, wait. This is this is the wrong year. It got published in two thousand eight. It just appeared in a sort of in a celebratory volume again okay. in twenty. It was reprinted in twenty thirteen. It got it. This was the first empirical study. What people really did with this? What the real practical yeah. use of that notation and, was? And your next one, your third most popular, is blockchains for business process management. Yeah, that's just a that's a catchword article. That's yeah. search engine <laughs> optimization immediately, right? It's it like also blockchain. has fifty authors on it, or something. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I think I think you have a sense for it. You're your one with Stefan and Jan van Broek, the sense making and sustainable practice. I think that's a great one because you have sense making, you have affordances. Right. Yeah, so I think you cool. actually you're not giving yourself enough credit. You actually in yours, you you do a pretty good job. I think no, I think this is exactly what I mean. Like if you look at the, the Google Scholar, you see these are the most cited ones and they happen to have yeah. exactly the titles that would lend themselves to being discovered and used and read and cited. These are That's not the ones that I would think these are the papers that should be cited a lot and stuff like this. No. Anyway. Right. Um, I, I got one more. You got one more for 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 Jerry's paper. I like it. Really okay. Got me thinking, I have to say, yeah. Uh, he has two more really big things that I want to want to talk about. The one of them is this section five point two introduction where I spent the most time writing. I just want to reiterate yeah. that. Um, uh, you know, the normal advice is write the first section last or something like this. But I don't do it like that at all. I every single mm -hmm. time I pick up a paper, I start from the beginning. So it's called writing from the top. Right from yeah. the top. Every single time that very first sentence gets, gets my attention, which I think leads to the very first page usually being the best of the entire article. And I think that's yeah. a good thing. It should be. Yeah. And it should be, exactly. So it really means like if I go over a paper 40 times, 40 times I've revised the introduction, but probably the conclusion only three times. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, and I think that's a, I will always keep that up. Even though it does mean I always go back and make more changes to the front, matrix and front. But I really think writing from the top is a big, big, big good idea. But, but there are two reasons for redoing the introduction all of the time. Uh, the first is because that's the first thing people read. And if you don't do a good job there, they're not going to read the rest of the paper, right? So that that so it makes sense to have that be perfect. But I think there's a more uh, tactical, uh, you know, to, to help get your paper done. I think the introduction is has to have all of the necessary components of your argument and then the rest of your paper elaborates on your introduction right where you have to say what you're doing and why and and yeah. i think what you found some people don't put their conclusions in the introduction i always say and at least hint at least summarize the the conclusion the top yeah. conclusion right so so if you can't very succinctly say what you're doing why and the conclusion <clears throat> you you don't have a story. So why write the rest of the paper? Now, sometimes it's iterative. As you're writing the paper, you're changing, adding nuance, honing in on your story. Every time you do that, you update the story on the front end. So that's the one thing. So it's that's where your outline is and that's where your succinctest form. The other is, is it brings... Uh, you have research collaborators, right? Sometimes you have slightly different ideas about framing, about, right? The introduction is where you sort that out. Yeah, Once you know what you're writing about, the terms you're using, the discuss right then, the rest of the paper you can do a little bit of a that's division. The, that's the point that I wanted to make. I think this, this, these first couple of pages they set out the terminology for the, the you mm -hmm. know the, the the language really the vocabulary for the rest of the paper. So if you make yeah. changes there, it has to ripple through the rest of the paper. And I do think one of the I see this a lot with some junior co-authors that I have. Sometimes when they yeah. take on a paper, they literally go straight to the method section and update this part about. I don't know, measurement or something, or they go back and at that new table. And actually, really, they very often they introduce inconsistency. You know, the yeah. way that they put this little thing there and they're like, oh, yeah, I've, I worked on this part here, but I haven't looked at the first 20 pages in the last couple of revisions. Well, you should have. Yeah. Like, always start yeah. from the top, right from the top to make sure that whatever slight change in terminology you introduce there then literally goes through the rest of the paper. 
Well, all right. So Jerry, Jerry cites Aaron Baird's paper from it's an editorial about how to write papers. You know, there's a lot of these, but Aaron in his uh, says two things. One is the red thread yeah. of a paper. And then the other is the hourglass. And, and I've heard the, both of these in, in, in the hourglass as an hourglass, the red thread is, you know, a thread. I didn't know it was colored red, but you need that thread running through your paper to connect the front to the middle to the data to the end right so that thread i think is important but the hourglass is really cool because it's the and dick boland uh always said to do this is that you frame your paper you motivate your paper you're tackling your paper in this big space with these big questions big then you do your little tiny paper then you point out how with your little contributions and then you point out how that matters to the bigger scheme to me to me the 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 one discipline that does hourglassing really well is uh, psychology behavioral psychology how people make decisions under uncertainty in general and then the actual study is about how someone flipped a deck of cards from red to blue when they didn't know whether the card was red or blue and then it goes back and this is how people make decisions uh, about their life under uncertainty mm-hmm. you know this is their yeah. perfect hourglass the first they start really big have a very narrow substantive study about something and then go big again so i i can't write like this to be honest yeah. i can't do it like can you do that the hourglass does it work well i don't know i think it's a nice thing to think about right i i probably don't do it i i start incremental go through incremental and, and but i think it's a nice way to think about it like at least in the first sentence or two of your intro say hey here's a bit major phenomenon right and then in your in your provocation at the end you might say okay this could have implications for this major phenomenon right i mean it's, it is consistent with your hook strategy right if you say look yeah. what is the problem domain and what is the specific thing in that domain it's sort of you're starting from the hourglass aren't you yeah, yeah. Like, so for me Dick- like the same with your hook strategy it works for me it's a very nice way for me to to be disciplined in how I construct things, but I can't really write like this. If I look at my published yeah. paper, I don't think that my introduction correspond to that hook. I know that yeah. I think about it this way, but the way that I actually put it on paper is a little bit more like, for example, the the bad guy, good guy metaphor. Yeah. I use that a lot more, yeah. like introduce yeah. a bad guy. The bad guy is very often the literature or some assumption or something. And then the good yeah. guy, which is usually us, you know, yeah. solving the problem like John Wayne did <laughs> anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good way to do it, uh, and and of course, setting up attention is is what they say to do. And and we, I'm sure we've talked about it on the podcast before. But there's that idea of a gap in gap spotting, right? And how pathetic that is. You know, nobody has studied, you know, blockchain in BPM yet, so therefore we will, right, or whatever it is. And it's like, well, just because no one studied it doesn't mean you should, right? Maybe no one studied it because it's not necessary. Maybe there's nothing there, right? So the fact that no one has studied something doesn't mean you're, you you should have. You have to give me a little more there, right? So, so gaps suck. Uh, anyway, but I wanted to go back to the hourglass. The guy who told me about the hourglass first was Dick Boland. Now, Dick Boland was one of my, is, is one of my mentors and he's uh, during my PhD. And I remember writing with him uh, it was a conference paper or something. Usually I didn't write with him. And if you look at any of his papers, they're beautifully written. And this is this little exercise one afternoon. And I think we sent the paper to like AMSIS or something and then never paid attention to it again and whatever. But for an afternoon, I actually wrote with him. We were at a computer and this is what taught me how to write because I realized what he was doing. I would just write a bunch of crap and get it all down. And He was writing a sentence. Then he would go back and rewrite that sentence. Then he would go back and rewrite that sentence. Then he would move on to the next sentence. He would make sure it connected with the previous sentence. Then he would rewrite that sentence. Then he would go back. Then he'd get a paragraph out. Then he'd go back and rewrite that paragraph. He was rewriting so much. He was agonizing over the perfect word. He would pause during his writing and think, what would be the right word here? And if you go look at Dick's work any of his research he has this beautiful paper in uh information and organization the tyranny of space and organizational analysis of course he's got his most famous paper which is the perspective making and taking paper he he has brilliant work but i think one of the reasons it gets picked up and people like his work is he writes beautifully and that's when i realized now i'm not quite like dick but that uh you know thinking about how one sentence flows to the next and getting rid of anything that isn't important is a really good practice for, for it is writing a really good practice. My, my example there is writing with Andrew Burton Jones. We re- we've mm-hmm. written two, uh, two papers, I think together anyway, and he's a slow writer, but he's like that. 
er, he thinks about every word. So every now and then, he, the paper is with him for a couple of days, and he comes back with two sentences. But the two <laughs> sentences, they're picture perfect. Like you mm -hmm. can't say it any better. Like uh, uh, it, it's concise. It's like Hemingway in motion, but really slow mm. because he thinks about every word. And I, I, I don't like I, 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 I get stuff on paper. Yeah. yeah. So not necessarily. I don't. But then you I, revise, right? You don't just and get I revise your first draft and revise and revise. My, my the, drafts yeah. are always up for you know, picking it apart, which, which is sometimes an issue with your junior colleagues because then they yeah. don't do it. They don't dare not touch it. And I'm like, yeah. this is just what I wrote down in three minutes, you know, like, but, yeah. uh, you know, go, go make it better. I don't think this is good. I just, yeah, just wanted to get content on paper so we can work with it because it yeah. takes me what they do by thinking very carefully. It takes me 20 iterations. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a different process with hopefully a similar outcome, not quite as poetic, of course, and not quite as brilliant, but you know, uh, so people have different yeah. styles and I think it's, yeah, got to figure out what your own style is. And then I think it matters who you work with because sometimes they can yeah. clash a little bit. If you have too many people that just put stuff on paper, uh, that doesn't work really well. And if you have people, if you have people that really agonize over every word, that's just really slow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it is. I try to, I mean, I guess I'm probably somewhere, I don't know where I am in the, in the middle, but I get on these spurts where I'll just write and things will come out right and then and then i keep the spurts going and if i don't have citations or i don't and i'm just getting pen to paper then then i'm doing well right and then i'll go back and add some citations and clean it up sometimes other times i will spend two days on three paragraphs you know so yeah, i bounce so back and forth hey so i know we have to wrap up soon i just want to i think there's a one more little gem in, in jerry's uh, how to write an a paper which i really loved and i never thought about it this way at the very end he talks about practical implications and it's just really nice uh, little um a guideline he, he, he writes something like look we're writing academic papers dude do you have a baby crying in the background probably yeah I don't hear very like I have noise canceling headphones because I have a baby crying in the background. <laughs> All I right. Think I should go look. Anyway, no, getting back on track. So he write, he says that look, uh, think about your practical implications. How many academic research implications? How many practical implications? If you have too many practical implications, then maybe you're writing a practitioner paper. I think that's a wonderful idea. It's a very nice little uh, rule of thumb to say like look, if you if you struggle to find your research implications section with more than one thing, but you have these three pages with five practical implications. Well, maybe mm -hmm. you're writing a California management review article here and not an MISQ yeah. article. I never thought about it this way, but I think it's really useful, right? If, yeah. it's, if it's easy for you to come up with four practical implications, then maybe, you know, you should send it to MISQ executive. Yep. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I think that, it, uh, well, again, practitioner articles, that's a whole, we should have a discussion of practitioner articles in one of, one of these podcasts. But yeah, I think there are, that, that's an interesting rule of thumb. He has a, a bunch of other rules of thumb about what how many pages something should be and stuff like that. And, and it's all good. It's fine. But, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it's a nice little how to write a paper, some cool ideas. I think what's, what's cool about Jerry's paper is there are actually a couple of ideas there that you don't see over and over again yeah. like even my little intro thing it's like the amr how to write a or amj how to write an intro in amj it's very similar to what i say and you know there are all these this advice but i have to say this little one there were a couple of things that uh you don't typically see and i think the minimum viable publishable unit thing and the uh uh you know but yeah that, that was a big one yeah. And then the Maybe. it's not a it's not simply a report of your research, I think is critical. And it's because we're not a high paradigm field. We have to establish our conversance and we have to uh and then we have this issue where yes, what we're saying may be an extension to our conversance, but because we have such a diverse field, there might be some other domain that actually knows what we're talking about already. And therefore they don't let us get away with it for this domain. So a perfect example would be Herb Simon's bounded rationality, right? He wins a Nobel prize because he's telling economists that we're bounded really rational because in their discussion, they just think we're optimizing, right? Uh, but other people knew we were, but the economists didn't read the other stuff, so they didn't, you know, they didn't hold Herb to his, you know, so they gave him a Nobel Prize. The problem with us, if we were to write boundedly rational to our economists in IS field, 
we chances are we'd get some of these people who read other papers and they would say, yeah, but look, the psychology people or whoever, you know, these other people have already, they know that, right? And, well, you know, and then I, you have to know what you dance mean. I mean, between the, what your conversants are saying and what everyone else in the field is saying. And you got to somehow reconcile this, right? You're right. I mean, but it's similar with this gap spotting versus problematization. I mean, Aaron wrote about it in his little editorial paper. And, and you, you said it before. I mean, this goes back not only 10 years when Jürgen Sandbeck wrote about it. This is an old idea. Don't look for yeah. gaps, look for problems, right? It goes back 40, 50 yeah. years. However, at the same time, most of the papers that I get as an editor or reviewer don't do it. So yeah. maybe there is value for a paper like like last year, Robert Davis and ISJ, they wrote a, an editorial on problematizationized research. There's nothing yeah. new in there, except yeah. for apparently most people don't know about it or something, or yeah. at least don't do it. So maybe there's a, yeah. there's a need every now and then to write a paper like how to write and how to do this and how to problematize, etc. over and over again until it's really you know, common routine practice. I wanted to say one thing to, to finish things off. These papers are nice, you know, these types of how-to, uh, how to write, how to do a good qualitative uh, analysis, how to do good stats, how to do, you know, they're all nice. We take them and put them into our seminars and, you know, doctoral courses. Like I, I teach a writing class and I'll take this paper, you know, but I don't think they really help people how to write. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like it's the same. I, I, I take a, I can read Yin's textbook on qualitative case study research. And it tells me, yeah, look here, single case design and this and chain of evidence. What exactly is that? Like, I think I always think even with writing paper, what helps much better if to take a really good paper, a really well written paper and learn from that. And imitate remember, like, it. La yeah, yeah, and imitate it. Remember last uh, year we gave these awards uh, yeah. for, and many of the papers were from that next generation theory, special issue from the quarterly. Well, these are mm -hmm. brilliant examples. Well, we talked about this. They were great examples of how to bring theory forward, but also great example of how to write them. And I think there, mm -hmm. some of the tables and some of the figures and some of the ways that they build, develop the proposition, I think that's more helpful because it's more concrete on what exactly do we mean when we say integrate the literature really well? What the fuck does that even mean? Well, here, yeah. you know, here's a table that shows you what that actually looks like. So I yeah. always like to go by examples more, You're not even with this, but also with, with, with quantitative. Like a yeah. stats book is fine, but I want to see how one paper calculated these stats for that imputation. I don't know, you know, for something like yeah. this. That always helps, I think. And it's surprising how, how often we don't uh, you don't see the people will submit and we'll see this all the time in qualitative. Like if you're going to do a qualitative paper now in the ISR, MISQ organization science, right? There's, well, of course there's the Goya thing that we've talked about, but, but what we'll see is we'll see tables. We'll see a lot of evidence for assertions. We'll see showing and not telling. Uh, you see certain practices in those qualitative papers that once it's published, it's pretty much uniform, right? You're seeing the actual data exam. And then you get these papers sent to you that don't do that. Yeah, right? exactly. They don't follow that practice. They're following some other practice from 1985 or something. I would suggest you go back and look at the last three years in that genre. If you're doing an experiment and you're submitting it to find a journal, a good experiment from find the last three years. experiment yeah. papers in the last and, and just copy the their journals. format and Absolutely. their structuring and their argumentation from the journal you're submitting it to. If it's qualitative, go find one in the last two, three years in that journal. If it's, economic go find one right and then and then copy it copy its structure copy its format copy what they say well don't don't plagiarize but just copy the structure right but it goes for all the artifacts it goes for paragraphs it goes for tables it even goes for diagrams like i'm, I'm working mm. on a, a piece that's a little bit about dialectics so mm -hmm. one thing that i've done is over the last four years i looked at all the top papers that have dialectics models which are dialectical process models just how they mm. how what that diagram looks like you know, if it's about circles or arrows or timelines, you know, what does it look like? Because I want to copy a similar way of visualizing the same thing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm horrible with images. I always uh, yeah, I, I need my co-authors to help with those. Uh, do a better figure. Yeah, do a better. That was last time, right? We we talked about that. Do a better that. figure, please, Nick. Please do yeah. a better figure next time around. Let's do a better Bring podcast me a rock. next time. Bring me a rock and do a better podcast next time. <laughs> yeah, next time, better podcast. All right. Good talking to you. Talk to you next time. All right. Adios.